Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is November 16th, and Thanksgiving is just eight days away. Hard to believe. I am feeling the heat myself. I'm going to be hosting Thanksgiving up at the cabin, and I have not been up to the cabin in about three weeks. So I need to get up there this weekend and just get ready. I may not come back down to Maple Grove. I may just have Phil take John to high school, and I'll stay up there and get ready. I have three turkeys to prepare. I have a ham to prepare. I'm going to put together the dressing, our giblet dressing. It's a family recipe. We love it. So if you're interested in it, shoot me a DM, and I will send it to you. And then another tip I have for gardeners that are in cold areas is that if you had an herb garden this year, Your herbs are probably freeze-dried right now, so if you need them as you're preparing some of your Thanksgiving dishes, don't forget to head outside and gather some of the herbs that Mother Nature has freeze-dried for you. They work just fine. So, handy little tip. But what I wanted to talk about today, really quick before we get into garden history, are two aspects of your garden that I think are worthy of your attention right now as all the leaves are off the tree and as you may or may not have your first light coating of snow, and that is the topography of your property and the furniture, the outdoor furniture that is on your property. So let's talk topography first. Gardeners always talk about the bones of the garden, and topography is part of that. Topography is the carpet, is the flooring of your garden. And if you have a flat yard or a flat property, you can really struggle with the flooring of your garden, with the interest level, because it's just too flat and boring. So consider bringing in elements that will make the floor of your garden more interesting, whether that's boulders or berms, or maybe even going deeper, adding a sunken garden or a sunken outdoor area for you to entertain in. All of those will make the floor of your garden, the topography of your garden, much more interesting. And now is the perfect time to put your eyes on that part of your garden and see if it is life-giving to you. Is it interesting or is it meh? All right, and then the other thing to think about is the furniture that you use outside in your garden. It is so funny how all summer long we can make do with outdoor furniture. Maybe we cover it up with a blanket or some cushions or some pillows, or maybe the flowers and the productivity of our garden is just so distracting that we don't notice how dilapidated the bench has gotten or how bad the table looks. But it's this time of year when those elements, when pieces of furniture can really show themselves in their current state. Maybe they just don't have it in them to make it another season. Maybe this winter is their final goodbye. Well, you will be better able to see that right now as you're getting ready for the holidays than you are in, say, August and September when there is so much left to do. And by the way, if you hear the little pitter-patter of feet, that is Max because he just came into the office to see what I'm doing and he was disgusted that I wasn't going to play fetch with him. So he's already out of here. He's not hanging around for this. So anyway, just a couple of ideas for you as you're thinking about your outdoor space, which you no doubt are because we're all looking outside to see the change in the weather, to check for more snow, maybe to look out on some of the things we didn't get done before the weather took a turn for the worse. So just some things to consider, your topography and your outdoor furniture. All right, let's get to today's garden history. Today in garden history, we celebrate the birthday of Jean Chardon, the French jeweler and traveler. He was born on this day, November 16th in 1643. 
Jean is remembered for his 10-volume work, The Travels of Sir John Jardin, which is considered to be one of the most important early accounts of both Persia and the Near East. And in his masterwork, Travels, Jean wrote about the Persian love language of tulips. And I love what he wrote here. He wrote, When a young man presents a tulip to his mistress, he gives it to her to understand by the general color of the flower that he is on fire with her beauty and by the black base of it that his heart has been burnt to a coal. So he's got it bad. And today we also remember Elizabeth Fox, also known as the Baroness Holland. She was an English political hostess and a flower lover, and she died on this day, November 16th in 1845. But when she was 15 years old, Elizabeth married Sir Godfrey Webster, who was 20 years her senior. And after having five children in six years, she started to have an affair with a Whig politician named Henry Fox, the third Baron Holland. And of course, she got pregnant. And when she had his child, she ended up divorcing Godfrey and then quickly married Mr. Fox. Together, they had six more children. And this marriage was very fortuitous for Elizabeth. She is remembered for her strong will and her domineering nature. She was a zealot socialite, and she was highly passionate about flowers, which her husband supported. He was a very easygoing guy, this Henry Fox, and he had the money to help fund all of the things that she wanted to do. And in garden history, it is Elizabeth Fox who is remembered for introducing the Dahlia to England. Now, the story for how that happened goes like this. In 1804, Elizabeth visited the Royal Botanic Gardens in Madrid. And when she was there, she met with a botanist named Antonio Jose Cavanias, and he gave her the seeds of the Dahlia Pineda. And when she returned to England, Elizabeth had these little seeds with her, and no doubt she had some wonderfully talented gardeners who were working with her at her gardens at Holland House. And long story short, they were able to cultivate this dahlia. And through that cultivation, that dahlia ended up making its way to Elizabeth's friends and to other flower lovers all throughout the country. Well, 20 years later, Elizabeth's beloved second husband, Henry Fox, was so proud of what she had done in her effort to share the Dahlia with England that he wrote these words to her in a little love note. The Dahlia you brought to our isle, your praises forever shall speak, mid gardens as sweet as your smile, and in color as bright as your cheek very sweet, Henry Fox. All right, and today we also remember Dennis Zerngiebel, the Swiss-born naturalist, florist, and plant breeder. He died on this day, November 16th in 1964. Dennis established his home in Needham, Massachusetts, and once he did that, he sent for his wife and their young son, Dennis and Henrietta had four children, and their only daughter, who was also named Henrietta, married Andrew Newell Wyeth, and their son was N.C. Wyeth, the realistic painter. Little fun fact for you. But during the 1860s, Dennis started working for the Arnold Arboretum at Harvard University, and then he pivoted and bought a 35-acre tract of land along the Charles River in Needham, and it was there that he started his floral empire. Now, Dennis was an excellent businessman. He had a knack for it, and he expertly marketed his inventory of flowers. In fact, his flowers ended up getting shipped regularly to both the White House and the State Department every single week. 
And in a nod to his Swiss heritage, Dennis was the first person in the United States to cultivate the giant Swiss pansy, a flower that is beloved in Switzerland. Dennis's Needham Nursery grew so many giant Swiss pansies that the town adopted the flower as their floral emblem. So if you're ever in Needham, Massachusetts, look up the giant Swiss pansy. See if you can see traces of that floral emblem throughout the town. And so this is why Dennis Zerngiebel is forever remembered as the Pansy King. Rest in peace. All right, and it was on this day, November 16th, back in 2001, that the French film Amelie was released in the United States. It's one of my favorite films. It's full of whimsy. And in the movie, Amelie steals her father's garden gnome to help him escape his depression after losing his wife. Amelie gives the gnome to an airline stewardess, and her dad starts receiving photos of his garden buddy visiting iconic travel destinations like Monument Valley, the Empire State Building, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, and the Sphinx in Cairo, Egypt. And in the end, Amelie's plan works. And in the final scene, it's her dad who is setting off on his own adventure inspired by his little garden gnome. So a great film for gardeners. There are a lot of other little stories in this film, but if you're looking for something very sweet to watch over the holidays, check out Amelie from 2001. I'll put a link to it in today's show notes. And on a historical note, Amelie got me thinking about garden gnomes, and I decided to do a newspaper search for one of the earliest references that I could find about garden gnomes. And the oldest one that I could find was from July 9th in 1928, and it was a little photo with just a brief snippet of a mention in the Liverpool Echo. The article announced quaint garden ornaments, a quaint little tribe of people, garden gnomes, 60 in number were sold by auction in Liverpool. And then it says they were imported from the continent. So garden gnomes in 1928. And if you can find an earlier reference to them, please send it my way. I would love to read about it. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Revolutionary Genius of Plants by Stefano Mancuso. This book came out in 2018, and the subtitle is A New Understanding of Plant Intelligence and Behavior. The Wall Street Journal raved about this book in their review. They said, in this thought-provoking, handsomely illustrated book, Italian neurobiologist Stefano Mancuso considers the fundamental differences between plants and animals and challenges our assumptions about which is the higher form of life. The editor of Mancuso's book wrote, Stefano reveals the surprisingly sophisticated ability of plants to innovate, to remember, and to learn, offering us creative solutions to the most vexing technological and ecological problems that face us today. Despite not having brains or central nervous systems, plants perceive their surroundings with an even greater sensitivity than animals, and they efficiently explore and react promptly to potentially damaging external events thanks to their cooperative shared systems. Now, Stefano introduces this controversial topic of plant memory and understanding this way. Here's what he wrote. After years spent investigating the many aspects of plant intelligence, I have been consistently surprised and fascinated by plants' clear capacity for memory. Maybe that sounds strange, but think about it for a moment. It isn't too difficult 
to imagine that intelligence is not the product of one single organ, but that it is inherent to life, whether there is a brain or not. If you submit a plant, for example, an olive tree, to stress like drought or salinity, it will respond by implementing the necessary modifications to its anatomy and metabolism to ensure survival. There's nothing unusual in that. But if after a certain time, we submit the same plant to the exact same stimulus, perhaps with an even stronger intensity, we notice something that is surprisingly only on the surface. The plant responds more effectively to the stress than it did the first time. It has learned its lesson. Somewhere, it has preserved traces of the solutions found. And when there was a need, it has quickly recalled them in order to react more efficiently and accurately. In other words, it learned and it stored the best answers in its memory, thereby increasing its chances of survival. Well, as you can tell, Stefano is passionate about this topic, and his clarity and conversational tone take these scientifically modern concepts and help us to see plants on a new plane of understanding. This book is 240 pages of the latest plant research and gorgeous botanical photographs to illustrate some wild ideas about the plant world. You can get a copy of The Revolutionary Genius of Plants by Stefano Mancuso and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $4, and that's a steal. All right, we end the show today with a botanic spark that celebrates Shirley Hibbard, the English journalist and garden writer. He died on this day, November 16th in 1890. Shirley Hibbard edited three enormously popular gardening magazines, including Amateur Gardening, which is still published today. And he's remembered as one of the most successful garden writers of the Victorian era. But if you've never heard of him before, you're not alone. Shirley's life story was lost to time until the garden historian Anne Wilkinson wrote his biography after 15 years of painstaking research. And Anne shares a wonderful timeline of what she could piece together about Shirley's life on her website. And the result is a wonderful and poignant mix of gardening passion and personal tragedy, as evidenced by the events that she outlines that happened between 1877 and 1885. And in this span of eight years, this is the eight-year period that I just plucked out of his timeline, Listen to what he accomplished. In 1877, Shirley wrote The Amateur's Kitchen Garden. The next year, he wrote Home Culture of the Watercress. He got a gold medal from the RHS. The next year, he writes a book totally groundbreaking, and the title of this book is Water for Nothing, Every House Has Its Own Water Supply. He was a natural marketer, wasn't he? And the other work that he wrote at this time is called Familiar Garden Flowers. Now, the following year, in 1880, Shirley's wife, Sarah, dies of heart disease. She'd been sick for a long time, and she is buried in Abney Park Cemetery. In 1881, Shirley ends up getting married to his cook. Her name is Ellen Mantle, and he starts to edit Amateur Gardening. Three years later, in 1884, Shirley and Ellen move to Kew. He starts working for the RHS. He's renovating their garden at Chiswick. So he is immersed in his garden work at this time. But then the following year, in 1885, Shirley loses his second wife, Ellen, after giving birth to their daughter, who no doubt is named Ellen in honor of her mother. And Ellen Hibbard is also buried in Abney Park. Meanwhile, Shirley stays busy and he organizes a pear conference. 
So that is just a little glimpse into the life of Shirley Hibbard. Something else to keep in mind as you're thinking about all of the things that Shirley was accomplishing, just remember that he was a champion of amateur gardening in the Victorian era. And this is a time when amateur gardening is looked down upon. It is thoroughly rebuked by horticultural high society. But Shirley's natural curiosity and his passion for gardening and all of its ancillary interests overpowered any scorn that he might have faced. And maybe in light of all of his personal suffering and setbacks, any public outcry or dismay from the elites just paled in comparison to what he was dealing with. But when it came to gardening, Shirley was a conscious competent. He knew what he knew, and he knew it so well that he was an excellent teacher, and he was eager to educate others about gardening. And so most of his books are actually about that topic. But he also wrote about things like gardening in the town. He wrote about aquariums and keeping aquariums and using them. He wrote about beekeeping, and he wrote about conservation. He was truly ahead of his time. And by the way, those are just a few of the topics. Shirley wrote well over a dozen books. And it was Shirley Hibbard who once wrote these words about why he thought flowers were so wonderful. Shirley wrote, The social qualities of flowers are so many that it would be difficult to enumerate them. Upon entering a room, we always feel welcome where there are flowers about, the hostess appears glad, the children are pleased, the very dog and cat are grateful, and the whole scene and all souls seem more hearty and homey and beautiful in the presence of bewitching roses, orchids, and lilies, and mignonette. And I couldn't agree more. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening to The Daily Gardener. I'm so glad you made it all the way through to the end of the show. And don't forget to take a look at your garden and evaluate the topography and your garden furniture. Now it's a great time to make a change. And just a reminder that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website site or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your friend. I'm your friend. Oh my gosh. Okay, too much popcorn. Okay, let's start over. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about way too loud, and let's try it again. Here we go. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature.